Hello, everyone. My name is Jimmy Gia, and I am the uh, chapter chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum Northwest. Welcome to tonight's event on the future of the human body. Uh, the Enterprise Forum, for those of you who have not come to one of our events before, we are a organization of over 20 chapters across the world. Um, and we are here to inspire, educate, and entertain entrepreneurs and support that uh, entrepreneurial environment. We are completely volunteer driven. And so for a program like today, we have a really nice big team this time of volunteers helping us put this together who include uh, David Anderson. And please uh, stand up when your name is called. Uh, David Anderson, Heidi Drivdahl, Chad Evans, Aidan Jameson, Shirley Lundy, Bob Marcus, Paul Meehan, who is also the program team lead, Vicki Owens, Amelia Pavel Paul Aveda, uh, Paul Reinhardt, Adam Schuster, Rohan Seagal, Nat Seymour, Zihu Zhang, Joseph Zhu Sun, Christina Larry, and Delia Fontaine. Thank you very much for helping us put this program together tonight. And if you're interested in helping us put on another program in the future, uh, please come and find one of us with these flappy things on, and we'll be happy to get you uh, engaged and involved. Um, we also cannot be here today without any of our sponsors. Uh, T-Mobile is our premier sponsor today, and they also have a list of uh, job openings for the Puget Sound region. So if you're looking for a job, um, head into that corner over there. Uh, but also Artifact Group, Summit Law Group, and then in-kind sponsors, Free Law Computing, Net Reflector, the MIT Club of Puget Sound, Puget Sound Video, and our host for tonight, Cambia Grove. And representing Cambia Grove is Molly Moore, who will come up and say a couple of words. Hi, welcome to the Cambia Grove. So this space was essentially built to host events just like this, to bring entrepreneurs together with healthcare people and people who are curious about starting businesses in healthcare and developing solutions that make our healthcare system more effective, efficient, and more person focused. And so I welcome you to this space. Um, you can find out more information about this space and why it was built and our mission um, by going to www.cambiagrove.com. And um, I just thank you so much for coming and being here. And we're super excited to um, have this program here tonight. This should be really, really excellent. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and I also want to acknowledge uh, Stoke Lawrence as well as Northwest Asset Management Group to be uh, being program captains tonight. So thank you very much for your support as well. Also come to some of our next programs, like I was mentioning, uh, in the Innovation Forum series, we have the future of artificial intelligence and robotics coming up in March, as well as the future of fun coming up in May. Uh, that should be a fun one, a common joke. Uh, and February 10th, we will be having our next Venture Lab uh, on venture capital in Seattle. And we have a number of the venture capitalists on a panel together. But a little bit more about today. And I think the future of the human body, we all have some sort of a story about that. And I have a story which is at the Future of Space program in December, I had to miss uh, because I had an emergency appendectomy. And someone challenged me to show you my scar. Um, <laughs> but the problem is I can't because I don't have one. And that goes to show you that today appendectomy can be done laparoscopically, which is absolutely a wonderful advance in the medical field. And another thing which just happened this morning, one of the volunteers on this particular program team could not make it today because of a dental emergency. And while she was sitting in the doctor's office, the dentist printed out a 3D printed version of the tooth that she was going to replace and then put it into her mouth. Now, that is also especially interesting because that particular volunteer started out with us in the 3D printing program two and a half years ago. <laughs> and today is the intersection of those two events. And so helping us lead us through this conversation of uh, the future of the human body is Luke Timmerman from the Seattle Times. He is a journalist uh, for 15, over 15 years, writes about biotechnology, based here in Seattle, writes nationally, uh, was formerly with Xconomy, um, was at the MIT, uh, was a fellow at the Knights Fellow 
science of journalism. I'm sorry, I messed that one up. So you can come up and uh, correct that one. Um, and just like any other entrepreneur, though, uh, he was telling me a story about how, how, how difficult it is to configure your internet when you first start a business, no, and no matter who you are. So Luke, thank you very much for uh, walking us through tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. You kind of got me wondering about what body part I would like to print if uh, I had the choice. I don't know, that's a good question. Um, so uh, thanks very much. It's great to be here at MIT Enterprise Forum. Um, I, uh, I got my start writing about biotech uh, here at the Seattle Times about 15 years ago, as Jimmy says, and then uh, I had stops at Bloomberg News, Xconomy, uh, before starting my own company about a year ago, exactly, uh, Timmerman Report. Um, and it's uh, kind of an old school model for the digital age, uh, paid content. Um, I sell subscriptions. Uh, and write two or three uh, in-depth original reports on biotechnology trends each week. Uh, commentary, news roundups, um, and, and more enterprising uh, research type reports. Um, and along with that, um, I've uh, been writing for Forbes and doing a podcast for uh, a new publication called STAT out of Boston. Some of you might have heard of. How, how many of you have heard of STAT? Alan has. Uh, he's an early adopter. But uh, it's a really interesting new experiment, as there are many experiments in media these days. Um, John Henry, the owner of the Boston Globe, uh, decided he wanted to uh, build a really great team covering health sciences in Boston. Brought in a bunch of Wall Street Journal, New York Times veterans, a team of 40 people. And they are uh, going after it and trying to bring biotech and uh, healthcare news to a wide audience. So I do a little podcast for them, and my podcast there, um, and my Forbes writing on the Wild Wooly free web supposedly help attract more people to uh, someday come subscribe to the Timmerman Report. So that's sort of my business um, in a nutshell. But when I think about tonight's, um, tonight's topic, I mean the future of the human body, this is about as broad as it gets. I mean, you could say that that's pretty much what biotech is all about, you know, the entire industry. Um, and, and we're biting off aspects of it with the speakers that we have here tonight. But I think um, a lot of the stories that you might see or have read um, the last year or two have, have, been, have taken on a pretty futuristic bent. You can definitely uh, you can see it with Google. Uh, they've gotten a lot of press for their Calico initiative. It's spearheaded by a couple of former Genentech people, very well regarded in the biotech industry, uh, that are you know, explicitly going after uh, human life extension. Um, they, they want to drill into the molecular biology. Um, some of that's been um, you know, studied for many, many years around telomerase. We'll hear more about that later tonight. Um, but that's an interesting one. Craig Venter uh, of Human Genome fame has a new company explicitly called Human Longevity Inc. And uh, they're sequencing genomes and you know, measuring all kinds of other parameters, metabolites in the blood, uh, proteomes. Uh, the microbiome, gathering tremendous uh, amounts of data on individual people and trying to tweak uh, your lifestyle, your diet, your exercise, see what some of these behavior modifications might add up to um, for, if not life extension, at least healthier aging is another way to think of it. Um, and if any of that sounds familiar, um, it should, because here in town we have a company uh, called Aravail. Uh, it was founded by Lee Hood, a um, very well-known scientific entrepreneur. I happen to be writing a book about him, too, so stay tuned for that. Um, but um, that, that company is doing a similar sort of thing um, with uh, gathering tremendous amounts of data on you as an individual, seeing what we can do to uh, improve your state of, of wellness w with some sort of scientific basis to it, not just the, the late night infomercial stuff that you read about, you know, kale smoothies or whatever. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, so aging, healthy aging, life extension, 
Um, there's a lot of scientific interest in this. It's been going on forever. I mean, I think about when I started writing about biotech 15 years ago, there, there were a couple of companies explicitly uh, in this business, Geron and Advanced Cell Technologies. I don't know, most people don't even remember these names anymore, but focused on telomerase biology in the former case and you know, stem cell biology in the latter. Uh, actually, both of them worked on embryonic stem cells for this stated purpose. Um, so it's not new, like this idea of trying to extend human lifespan. Um, uh, healthy aging um, is, is sort of a different spin on things. But um, I, I'm actually quite eager to hear what our speakers have to say here tonight about their various uh, approaches to this problem. Um, you know, first up, we're going to hear from Chris Fox from IDRI, formerly known as the Infectious Disease Research Institute here in town, um, working on new vaccines. So you might think, well, vaccines, those are for everybody. Actually, um, there's a lot of literature. Uh, elderly people uh, are much more vulnerable to opportunistic infections. Their immune system loses some of its, its punch. And there's a lot of interesting scientific work on how to optimize vaccines so that they, they will be more effective in the elderly. So that would be one way to live better, live longer. Um, after that, we'll hear from Brian Glaster of Cadence Biomedical, a local company, uh, and it's focused on a mechanical assist device for people who have suffered from stroke. Again, you know, very common affliction, hits people in old age, um, and debilitates their ability to do lots of activities of daily living and even just get around. Um, with, but with a simple mechanical assist, uh, simple, I don't mean to <laughs> insult you, Brian, but uh, we, we've learned that uh, the brain, we know the brain has neuroplasticity, and you can actually sort of, in a way, coach the brain to get around that damaged part and take over motor functions other ways with just a little bit of help in this case, a mechanical assist. So he can say more about that and will later. And lastly, uh, we'll hear from Liz Parrish of BioViva. Um, she's in the gene therapy business, and uh, she has some pretty provocative things to say about uh, how research should be done and how gene therapy should advance. And, and she's actually uh, put herself on the line uh, and, and done some interesting N of one experiments, um, which she can tell you about. Um, so um, I think with that, um, I think we're ready to go. So Chris, if you'd like to get us started, Chris Fox uh, from, from IDRI, um, I think you're all set to go. Thanks. I'm, I'm very privileged, feel very privileged to be a part of this and share a little bit with you um, tonight about what I think is a very important topic um, that has to do with, um, with the future of the human body. Um, <clears throat> and that topic is vaccine adjuvants, okay? And so to set the stage um, a little bit here, it's, it's no secret, I think, to, to all of us here that you know, infectious diseases, they really don't have any borders. And, of course, the one in the news right now is, is the Zika virus from Brazil. Um, but, uh, you know, a couple months ago, um, I opened up my National Geographic issue, I think it was the October issue, and there um, the editor explained how <clears throat> their writing and photography team had gone down to Honduras to um, excavate an archaeological site, and they all came back with this very strange disease that they'd never heard of called Leishmaniasis. Um, uh, a, a very um, uh, painful disease. It can be disfiguring. Um, this is a picture here of this, this woman um, has a leishmaniasis um, uh, disfigurement there on, on her face. And um, these, these diseases take you know, a terrible toll, um, not only in the developing world, but um, because of global travel and, and other things, um, we're affected more and more by them. And it's not just mortality here, but it's quality of life. Um, as you can imagine, um, sufferers of leishmaniasis are often shunned in their communities because of the, the often you know, very gross disfigurements that result. Um, <clears throat> 
But there's a technology that's, that's not new, it's been around a long time, and that is vaccines. And I think vaccines, there's, there's not a lot of dispute about the impact they've had on public health um, um, over the last century. And uh, the WHO estimates that there's 2.5 million lives saved every year. I think that's probably an um, underestimate. Um, <clears throat> and so um, vaccines have done a lot in this arena, and they will do a lot um, in the future. But there are some critical things that um, help vaccines work better. And um, I'm going to talk about one of those tonight, and that is um, adjuvants. But uh, before we go there, Let's just review really quickly what vaccines are. Um, so traditionally, vaccines were created by um, taking a, a pathogen, a bug, and um, either attenuating it or completely inactivating it, killing it, and then using that to stimulate an immune response in our bodies um, that was enough to protect us against subsequent exposure to that pathogen. but. Um, not so much that the vaccine itself would cause us uh, undue distress. So that worked for a lot of diseases, um, mainly the diseases that, that you're protected against through antibodies in your bloodstream. Um, and those, those were the first targets that we were really successful in, in making vaccines against, things like tetanus and diphtheria, uh, measles. Uh, in more recent years, um, you know, there's, there's still vaccines that are made that way because they've been proven to be safe and effective. But we're now focusing more on a synthetic approach where we identify the key components of the pathogen that are really what you want to mount an immune response against. We identify those that are usually proteins, and uh, then we synthetically make those proteins, and um, that becomes the core component of the vaccine. The only problem with that approach is that they're so highly pure and such a small piece of the actual pathogen that when the body sees those isolated proteins alone, it often doesn't um, see the need to mount a strong immune response um, against those. So <clears throat> this is where adjuvants come in, and one of the things they can do is make these you know, highly pure synthetic proteins very immunogenic. Um, if they're administered together with an adjuvant. Um, some of the other challenges in vaccine development have been that, you know, there are quite a few diseases that you need more than antibodies in order to be protected against. And so that's what we're, um, what we're trying to accomplish in diseases like uh, malaria, tuberculosis. These require a complex uh, cellular immune response in addition to um, the antibody response. And this is difficult to achieve with, with traditional vaccine approaches. Some vaccines are very difficult to manufacture. Um, for instance, uh, pandemic influenza, we currently cannot manufacture enough vaccine to cover the global population. There's a lot of people working on that. I'll talk about that. Um, another big challenge is that different age groups um, don't respond to vaccines the same way. So Luke mentioned the elderly. Um, they often, because of a term called immunosenescence, where the immune system you know, begins to lose its, its activity um, in our older years, they don't respond very well to vaccines. Um, a similar scenario is in very young children and infants who don't have a fully developed immune system yet. And yet, these two groups are often the ones most susceptible to uh, disease mortality. So what can we do to make vaccines more effective for them? And finally, deliverability. Um, can we get the vaccines made cheaply enough? Can we uh, make them stable enough? They can be delivered to um, the parts of the world where they're needed. And um, you know, once they're there, how many times um, does that uh, family have to walk several miles to the local clinic to get immunized? Can we reduce um, the number of times they have to do that and, and thereby increase acceptance of vaccines? Okay, so enough about vaccines. What about um, the adjuvant component? So I already talked about the protein component. That's what we call the vaccine antigen. That's what you want to mount an immune response against. Adjuvants are substances added to that protein component, which tell the body, hey, this is more than just um, a, a protein. This is a pathogen. 
or a pathogen-like um, situation, I need to mount a potent immune response. So what we do when we're designing adjuvants is we, um, we, we try to look for molecules that are present in pathogens. And now we're not talking about proteins so much, but uh, small molecules like lipids, like I'm showing here on the left. And there's some other signature molecules that only bacteria and, and, and viruses have, um, but humans don't. So when this accompanies a vaccine, these type of molecules, it tells the body, hey, this is dangerous. I need to mount an immune response. And, um, and so that's really the strategy. And sometimes it's not such, such the molecular um, strategy, but we're trying to mimic the physical properties. So can we make particles that are the same size as viruses or um, bacterial cells and um, have the same type of surface character? And that way the body once again says, hey, this looks like something I need to um, mount an immune response against. In reality, most adjuvants are a combination of these, of these classes that I've discussed. And um, together, they help the vaccine get where it's supposed to go, um, but they also instigate those signals in the body that says, yeah, this, is, this is a real danger. I need to uh, protect myself against this. So on the right there is a vial of, of a finished adjuvant product made in, in our facility. And um, that's what it looks like when it's all done. And that's always, you know, in the front of our minds is there's a lot of very elegant research on vaccines and adjuvants, but can we distill it down to make a product that's manufacturable and it can actually be used um, safely and, and where it needs to be in the field? Okay, so a little more about how adjuvants work. Um, for one thing, they can help the cells, our immune cells, um, take up the vaccine antigen uh, more readily. And so you get better deliverability of, of the vaccine, the protein component. Um, and it helps that vaccine be processed more efficiently, get to the right cells, and, and then um, traffic to the lymph node where um, your T cells and your B cells, um, where the action occurs there. Um, so um, an, an appropriate adjuvant recruits immune cells to the injection site, which then take up the vaccine. And, and go to the lymph node to activate uh, your, your B cells and T cells. Um, and adjuvants do this by activating cellular receptors um, at the injection site. And, and these are, um, like I mentioned, these are the receptors that are specifically um, out there to identify when foreign molecules, foreign particles come into our body. And they say, hey, this is dangerous. We need to induce an immune response. And it's not just about inducing higher magnitudes of immune response, but shaping that response, um, making the quality um, appropriate to the pathogen. Because as I, as I mentioned earlier, different pathogens require different types of immune responses, whether it's antibody or cellular. And adjuvants, if they're designed appropriately, can tailor your immune response to be most effective for that particular disease agent. So this is really the crux of, of the talk, and that is, you know, what do adjuvants um, do for us, and, and why do I think they're such a critical component in modern vaccinology? So I mentioned that they, they can um, increase immune responses. So a, a simple example of this is, is you get more antibody titers. Um, so for diseases like influenza, where antibody titers are critical, um, an adjuvant can give you more of those and thus um, give you better protection than a vaccine without an adjuvant. Um, in the case of these diseases that require more than just antibodies to protect against, um, this, this is what we call cell-mediated immunity. And adjuvants can induce um, that type of immune response as well. And that's why we're starting to see now vaccines um, against malaria. Um, I'll talk more about that. Um, the first vaccine um, just completed phase three testing in Africa against malaria. We're working on a vaccine for tuberculosis, similar scenario. And um, other parasitic diseases, um, these are the kind of complex pathogens that, that you really need this, this T cell based response. OK, a more practical advantage is something that we call dose sparing. And what I mean by that is because adjuvants boost the immune response you're getting from the same amount of vaccine, you can use less vaccine in the presence of an adjuvant. And so uh, 
what, what this translates into for something like pandemic flu, um, this is absolutely critical because it means we can get anywhere from five-fold up to 30-fold dose sparing effect if you include an adjuvant. So you've just multiplied your manufacturing capacity in a pandemic um, by an order of magnitude. Um, I remember in, in 2009, the H1N1 swine flu pandemic, does everyone remember that? Um, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter, was six months old at the time. And um, <clears throat> it's, it's difficult, it, it was only a few years ago, right? But it, it's difficult to remember um, how scared um, I think we all were at the time when the pandemic was first announced. Um, but especially those of you, if you had young kids, you know, your first um, inclination was, when's the vaccine going to be available? And um, we, um, you know, went to our clinic and they said, oh, they, they don't have them yet, they don't have them yet. I think it took about six months um, after the pandemic was announced before the vaccines arrived. Um, in the end, you know, they were, they were a, a lot later than, than would have been ideal. Um, and we had to go down to the, to the pediatric, pediatric clinic on a Sunday morning and literally the line um, went two blocks, out the door, one block, and then around the corner down the street. And we had to wait, you know, half a day to get our daughter vaccinated. In the end, you know, that um, swine flu pandemic wasn't as, um, as, as deadly as, say, the, the uh, Spanish flu pandemic from 100 years ago. But it gave us a good sampling of what a pandemic would really look like, right? It's a scary thought. And this is where adjuvants could really help out. Um, the same is true for other diseases like the inactivated polio vaccine. The world's trying to ramp up production of that. And there just isn't enough manufacturing capacity um, for what's going to be needed. And so this is where adjuvants could, could really help out. A, a similar take on that, rather than just reducing the amount of vaccine, you can also, with adjuvants, reduce the number of times you have to be immunized with a specific vaccine. And so um, a phase three study um, result was just announced um, in the case of hepatitis B, which requires normally three immunizations. And with a new adjuvant a company in, down in California is showing that um, they can get the same immune response with just two immunizations, even in immunocompromised populations like diabetics. Um, we mentioned the vaccines for the elderly, um, for the young children, and, and the best example of this is in influenza. So every year in the U.S., there's thousands of deaths from, from influenza. Most of those, 80 to 90 percent, are in people over 65 years of age. And uh, unfortunately, those are the ones that don't respond very well um, to the vaccine. Um, the FDA, just a few months ago, approved the very first seasonal influenza vaccine containing adjuvant for use in the U.S. Um, and it's specifically for those age 65 and older. And that's why they approved it. It's going to make their immune responses uh, much more potent against seasonal flu. That's called Fluad. Um, on the other hand, um, with very young children, they also, uh, and I'm talking, you know, six months to a few years old, they, they only have a modest immune response um, to flu vaccine. It's better than nothing, right? You should get your kids immunized against flu. Um, but they don't respond as well as, as older uh, kids and adults. Um, once again, and this is um, in Canada now, the Canada Regulatory Agency just a year ago now approved um, an adjuvanted flu vaccine for infants from six months to two years old for this very reason boosting their immune responses from, say, 50% protection to uh, 80 to 90% protection. And I think we'll see more and more of this um, as, as we continue developing adjuvanted vaccines. Another benefit from adjuvants is they can broaden our immune responses to be protective against different strains of the same pathogen. So a good example of this is the human papillomavirus. Um, which has multiple strains. There's two vaccines out there right now, uh, one from Merck, and that contains antigens or proteins from four different strains of the papillomavirus. There's another vaccine that includes a, a, a potent adjuvant, and that vaccine only has two of those um, viral strains. And yet, because of the adjuvant, 
the immune responses elicited are protective against those other two that aren't even in the vaccine. So you can imagine this is important for flu and other diseases where there's a lot of different strains out there. Um, adjuvants can broaden our immune responses against those. Um, rapid response to pathogens, uh, this goes back to sort of the pandemic um, um, point, and, and that is in the event of, of some kind of biodefense application, adjuvanted vaccines in some cases can, can actually protect you even after um, you've been infected with the agent. Um, and finally, therapeutic vaccines, um, such as cancer, other um, indications. One we work on is leishmaniasis. Vaccines given in combination with drugs um, can reduce the time to cure and, and have you know, fewer side effects than typical chemotherapy approaches. So adjuvants have had a long history, but it was very slow initially. Okay, so the first adjuvant really used in, in humans, um, we call it alum today, it's aluminum salts. And those were really first used um, in the early part of, of the last century. And for many, many decades, no other adjuvants were really approved uh, for human use um, outside of, of clinical trial testing. But you see in recent years that that paradigm is changing. Um, in Europe, uh, above the, the ruler there, and, um, but also in the US, um, we're seeing more vaccines containing adjuvants approved. And I think this is very exciting. Um, and we're gonna see more and more of this because of, of the data that I mentioned. And this is just what's happened in the last year, okay? So shingles vaccine, another um, indication where the elderly are very important. Uh, typically, protection was, was um, I think, in the existing vaccines, it's more around 60%. With an adjuvant included, uh, clinical testing shows you get 97 protection in the elderly. Even in the extreme elderly, you know, not just above 65, but, but older and older. Um, I mentioned that the infant vaccine for seasonal flu in Canada was just approved. Um, the very first malaria vaccine um, completed phase three testing in Africa and was given a positive opinion um, about six months ago, meaning it's going to go forward through production and, and use in Africa. And um, the reason this, and it's not a perfect vaccine, um, you're seeing somewhere between 30 and 50% protection in young kids, but the only reason it's, um, not the only reason, but a, a critical reason for its success is that it includes a very uh, potent adjuvant. Um, and finally, you know, I mentioned the, the seasonal vaccine for the elderly for flu, um, just a couple months ago approved by the FDA. And then um, the hepatitis B vaccine trial where they've reduced the number of immunizations. So these are very big steps forward. And I expect we'll see uh, more and more progress for adjuvanted vaccines. And I, I really think it is a golden age, not just for adjuvants, but for vaccines in general because of that. So what's the future? Um, first of all, it's not, you know, this, this um, blissful panacea. Uh, there are challenges with vaccine adjuvants. They're very difficult to develop and manufacture effectively, okay? And that's why for so many years there weren't many getting approved. Um, and it's not just identifying adjuvants, but making sure they're pharmaceutically formulated um, to be safe and stable. You know, they, they've got to be an, an actual product that can be used in the field. Um, they also complicate administration of vaccines in some cases. Sometimes adjuvants cannot be mixed with the antigen and stored long, stored, long term in the same vial. And so um, instead of getting a, a single vial vaccine out in the field, um, the clinician is having to mix the, the protein part with the adjuvant part and then take them up in a syringe. And you can imagine that creates opportunities for mistakes and, and complexity. So um, making adjuvants that are simple to administer and can be in the same vial as the vaccine is, is an important need. And maybe the biggest hurdle, especially in the developed world, is the public perception of safety concerns. Um, there's been a, a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's anti-vaccine sentiment, but um, I think that probably pales in comparison to if you Google adjuvant out there, you'll see a lot of this, um, oh, what are they putting into these vaccines? You know, they're, um, if you remember the Gulf War syndrome, 
um, from the, the Persian Gulf War in the early 90s. Um, some of the vets coming home had this um, difficult to explain autoimmune type disorder. And there was a lot of, of um, inaccurate press saying, oh, it was because of this new adjuvant that the government came up with. And that was later debunked, but still the perception's out there. You can still find all those old articles that are claiming that it's adjuvants cause those things. So it's true, um, adjuvants need to be developed very carefully and the dose has to be um, carefully designed so that they're not too reactogenic but are, are safe. And, and I think um, communicating that they are safe is something that us scientists need to do a better job of and get ahead of, of sort of the celebrity anti-vaccine crowd which, which um, will surely um, come out against them. So what opportunities do we have? Uh, I mentioned new vaccines coming out for diseases that have never had vaccines before. When we do come up with an HIV vaccine, and I think we will do that, um, it will contain an adjuvant. I'm, I'm almost positive of that. Um, the malaria vaccine contains an adjuvant. You're gonna see therapeutic vaccines against cancer that contain adjuvants. Um, you're gonna see the world be more prepared for the next pandemic flu. And um, this is a critical part of, of what we're trying to do at IDRI, and my final slide uh, will address that. And um, another thing that adjuvants may provide us the opportunity to do is to administer vaccines through alternative routes. So um, this can increase acceptance. Uh, for instance, we completed a clinical study recently where we administered a, a flu vaccine in the skin, so intradermally, um, with an adjuvant. And we got um, the same potency of immune response as a traditionally administered vaccine, which is in the muscle. The idea being that in a pandemic, you could get your vaccine in the mail and actually self-administer it um, um, in the skin rather than have a professional you know, inject you in the muscle. Um, and finally, there's, there's a very exciting developments. This is very early stage. But rather than the protein-based vaccine approach I mentioned earlier, we're going one step um, earlier and making vaccines based on the RNA sequence, which is then translated into the protein in your body. And so this means um, that we can make vac vaccines faster and cheaper, and uh, it'll be very interesting to see how this develops. Um, these aren't in the clinic yet. This is very early stage, but I think you'll hear more and more about that. Now, we can, we can answer that one quickly, but okay. we're, we're going to hold questions uh, f until after all the presentations are, are done. But yeah. go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Um, so adjuvants um, are substances added to vaccines, and they can be a variety of, of different substances. So sometimes they're um, small particles made out of lipids that mimic how a virus or a bacteria would look. Um, other times they're very specific molecules that uh, viruses or bacteria have or parasites. Um, and these can be lipid-like molecules. They can be DNA-like molecules. Um, so there's a range of different structures that can serve as adjuvants. But all of them in some way um, alert the body to say, this is a foreign agent. This is something I need to be careful with. Great. I think we're about done. Perfect. So this is the last slide. Um, and with, with the opportunities ahead, I think the main thing is going to be working together um, across the development spectrum. And um, at, at my company, IDRI, we're a nonprofit, um, and our intent is to build local capacity by teaching developing country manufacturers how to make adjuvants in their countries so that they can be prepared for things like pandemic flu and not rely on the rich countries when the pandemic hits. You can imagine what happened in 2009 with the swine flu pandemic. If vaccines were late in the US and Europe, imagine how late they were in countries like uh, Brazil and South Africa. Um, so this is what we're trying to do. And pharma the pharmaceutical industry is also getting interested in this, uh, partnering with Sanofi and, and other um, partners uh, with the intent to focus on these indications where adjuvants can really make a difference and um, thereby improve global health. And I think we'll do that. Great. Thanks a lot, Chris.
Chris is actually being modest. Um, Idri really does have uh, some really strong capabilities here in Seattle, and it was a part of um, developing that GlaxoSmithKline vaccine for cervical cancer, or developed the adjuvant, uh, that synthetic adjuvant that makes it much more potent against all the strains. So, uh, I mean, that, that was work that happened here. So. Next, next up, Brian Glaster, um, Cadence Biomedical. So this is going to be different. This, uh, um, and I think he's got uh, a prop here. Um, Brian comes prepared with his props, um, and uh, it's great because you'll you'll get us uh, to see um, how this thing works. Uh, that stroke victims have found to be quite useful. In fact, Brian was fortunate enough at the early days of his company to find an investor um, who needed a little bit of help. And she tried it out and said, I like this. <laughs> this, this is helping me walk better. And uh, so that was probably about the best investment pitch he's ever done, I would imagine. <laughs> that worked pretty well. So Brian, could you tell us a little bit more about what, what you're doing there at Cadence? Sure. Uh, thanks, Luke. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm uh, very appreciative for the invitation as well. Um, my name is Brian. I'm the founder of Cadence Biomedical. And we make a device called Kickstart that helps people recover to walking after a stroke or other type of neurological condition. Um, my background is uh, in mechanical engineering. I uh, uh, studied at a small school in Philadelphia called Villanova which had a great engineering program, but also a real commitment to service. Uh, so upon graduation, after spending time in Africa, uh, hanging out with uh, starving children, and uh, just felt like I really needed to, to find a way to uh, combine my, education, or my engineering background with something that could actually uh, help people and make the world better. Um, so long story short, I ended up here uh, at uh, the University of Washington to start a PhD and was working on uh, robotic prosthetic limbs to help people uh, that were missing legs who had an amputation. And I just was fascinated with the ability to build a device that could uh, essentially replace a, a lost function of a, a body and, and what an important function of, of walking to be able to uh, give this to somebody to, to help them regain their lives again. Um, but I grew frustrated because uh, our work in the lab was uh, more academic based. It was developing something that would probably cost two or three hundred thousand dollars if it ever left the lab. And I didn't think that uh, uh, Medicare or uh, uh, Mr. Smith down the road would ever be able to afford this on their own. So uh, while I loved the idea of developing uh, a mechanical device that could really help somebody walk, uh, I thought the missing link there was also putting a business model behind it to. Uh, get it out there and make it affordable for the people that it could really benefit from. And that was the core by, behind why we started uh, Cadence. And uh, Luke mentioned this uh, woman here. This is Donna Jang. Um, she had a stroke uh, over 20 years ago. And as you can see, uh, after a couple decades of, of uh, hard work in the therapy gym, she was still having some issues. Um, she leans heavily on her cane. She walks very, very slowly. Um, uses almost entirely her right leg while uh, her left leg has to swing around to the side. And as a result, she barely walked at all. She might walk 20, 30 steps a day, uh, just short distances to get somewhere and to sit down. And you might notice a, a segue there in the background. That was her main mode of mobility. Um, she would strap it on the back of her car. Uh, when she would get to uh, uh, an investment meeting, uh, pull it down, ride the segue to get in. Uh, get in a chair as uh, soon as she could, and pretty much lived her lives like you guys are today, looking up at the, at the rest of the world. So we gave her a, a kickstart, and uh, things changed pretty quickly. Um, here you'll see her uh, walking across the Golden Gate Bridge with a couple of, of uh, her best friends. Um, forgot to mention, she had terrible hip pain. Her uh, right foot was swollen, or her left foot was swollen beyond belief. Uh, within a week of using Kickstart, we had to give her a new pair of shoes because her foot had shrunk two sizes. Uh, the hip pain had completely gone away. And she had become completely independent after a few months. She had uh, increased her walking speed to the point where she could cross the street before the stoplight changed. And that's where therapists say, all right, good job. You're, uh, you're a completely independent community ambulator. Uh, go off and, and live your life. And, I thought, all right, this is a victory. We're on something here. We got a really great device that can 
uh, get people out of chairs, get them on their feet again, and get, their moving, uh, uh, get them moving around and rediscovering their lives. Um, but Donna's story didn't end there. And this is her in March, skiing at Lake Tahoe. Um, she hasn't touched her kickstart in about six months because she doesn't need it anymore. She can walk at these uh, independent community levels uh, without kickstart now. Um, and so this is the real success here. Uh, not only did we develop a device that uh, could be used as a walking aid to help people rediscover their lives, uh, it also had a therapeutic effect, which was something I was hoping for, but uh, Donna was the first uh, indication that that was actually there. So how did this happen? <laughs> Maybe we should uh, back up and learn a little bit about what a stroke is. Um, about 800,000 Americans are gonna have one every year. And a stroke is caused when uh, a blood flow through the brain is uh, blocked or, or disrupted. Uh, you can have either a, a, a caused by a blockage where a clot forms and uh, uh, prevents blood from flowing through, or you might have a hemorrhage, which is actually what Donna had, where a uh, blood vessel actually burst in her brain and, and, and bled for quite some time. And it actually results in brain damage. Um, and what's kind of interesting is if you have a stroke on the left side of your body, your right side is affected um, and vice versa. And a stroke can affect uh, your speech, um, can certainly affect your arm function, uh, but certainly uh, affects your leg function, uh, which, which can uh, cause some uh, terrible disabilities. Um, what the good news is, is the brain is highly adaptable and it's highly trainable. So we can actually re rewire the brain around these injuries. Uh, but the key is to do it with intense, repetitive exercise. And, and uh, uh, an extra key to that is to make sure that the patient is initiating that intense, repetitive exercise. So if there's uh, a patient intent being sent, and they can actually complete these mov movements, and they do it over and over again. Um, you can get a, a woman that had a stroke 20 years ago back on the ski slopes again. Um, for years, uh, the research had always been working on these complicated robotic systems. Uh, this is a device called a locomat. Uh, it's used in a handful of uh, rehab centers in, in, uh, throughout the world. I believe there's one here in the state of Washington. Um, but it costs about $300,000. Uh, so you can't, uh, can't put one of these in your basement gym if, if you have a stroke. Um, and this gentleman, I, be I believe, had a very, a very severe spinal cord injury. And you can uh, look here, he, he looks like he's hardly breaking a sweat because the robot is doing uh, most of the movement, which limits the, uh, the recovery he might have. Um, he's also limited by the amount of time he can get on the machine. Uh, at any one of those centers, there's a waiting list to get on these. Um, you can only uh, use it when you have physical therapy time. And if you uh, look at the outcomes from like a drug trial versus the outcomes from a rehab trial, the, uh, the effect sizes are always way smaller in a rehab trial because you don't usually get, uh, if you take a drug, you get that effect all day long. If you're doing a rehabilitation intervention, you only get it when you're actually doing that intervention, which could be a couple hours a week. Um, we thought there was a really important need here to develop affordable technologies that somebody could also use at home so that you could really maximize your time uh, doing the therapy and maximize your ability to uh, 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 get back to your lives. So instead of expensive robots, uh, we look to uh, Mother Nature. And the inspiration from Kickstart came from horse anatomy. So if you watch the Kentucky Derby, uh, you can see uh, now, the horses have these really big, beefy hip muscles, but they have really skinny legs. And in that leg, uh, in, in green here, you can see, are these really, really long tendons. And uh, a tendon is like a spring. And when the horse starts a step, this tendon stretches, and it stores a lot of energy, and it provides a lot of support and stability. And then it lifts the leg off the ground and swings it through so the muscles don't have to work as hard. So. Uh, this is why a horse can run all day long, and I get tired after uh, one trip around Green Lake. <laughs> so, since a uh, tendon is like a, uh, a spring, and uh, the horse tendons go all the way down the leg, we thought, why don't we put a really long spring on a human? So, uh, this is Kickstart. Uh, in this 
bag is a spring, but for marketing purposes, we call it an exit tendon because you can charge more for that. <laughs> and what we do is we strap this on a, a patient, we add some tension to the spring, then every step they take, it stretches and it stores more energy, just like the horse tendon does. And what this does is it really encourages a patient to bear more weight on that impaired limb, it encourages them to take a longer step on their good leg, and uh, this uh, stretches the hip flexor muscle, which is a really key neural signal to the spinal cord to let it know that uh, uh, the patient's walking. Uh, bless you. And then if uh, the patient shifts their leg over, the weight over, it'll lift the leg off of the ground and swing it through for the next step. And this is what gives the patient the, uh, uh, the endurance and the proper mechanics to help retrain that brain to uh, wire around the injury and recover to walking. Um, so this is all ne necessary so that we can amplify a patient's walking ability and this allows them to tolerate more therapy or make the most out of the, the time that they actually get that insurance will pay for it. Um, this helps accelerate their therapeutic progress and helps us get them back to uh, independence. And uh, uh, another point is to reduce uh, rehospitalizations because as we move in the Supportable Care Act model, if somebody is discharged and then they come back, uh, the hospital's on the uh, <laughs> Uh, has to foot the bill for the therapy the second time around. So uh, the more we can send people home and make sure that they're safe and they're mobile and, and they're independent, the uh, less chance there are that they're, they're going to come back. Um, so as you're thinking about uh, Mr. Smith down the, the street and his stroke and if uh, he's appropriate for this sort of thing, uh, just some uh, 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 quick guidelines. Um, we use Kickstart uh, most often with people that are recovering from a stroke, but really any neurological condition that results in weakness in the leg, uh, incomplete spinal cord injuries, multiple sclerosis, uh, we've done Lou Gehrig's disease, a lot of rare diseases that I uh, didn't know exist until I started this job. Um, anybody that's got weakness in the lower extremity, they might have a sort of a shuffling gait where they can't move one leg in front of the other. Uh, or they might have normal uh, biomechanics, but they don't have a lot of endurance for walking and standing. Um, really the key is, are they able to stand and maintain an upright posture, even if they're holding on for dear life in a walker or, or parallel bars? Um, but if they can stand and uh, at least start to initiate a step, that's uh, an indication that they might be a good kickstart candidate. And uh, because it's a uh, simple but still sophisticated device. Uh, it's affordable and it's covered by Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the VA, and most private insurers across the country. And we use it for a wide range of patients, um, from uh, people like this gentleman who hadn't taken a step in over four months, and his therapist is using it here just to reintroduce that idea of uh, moving his legs forward and backwards and starting to bear weight again on his limbs uh, before initiating full-blown walking. Um, up to this gentleman, uh, when I met him, he had been in an inpatient rehab hospital for about two weeks. Um, he was able to walk across a room, but it required a full harness system and two therapists to keep him safe and stable. Um, these are his first kickstart steps, and he continued them for about 45 minutes uh, and only needed one therapist at this point. Um, and then I called back a week later and they told me the guy had used it five more times. Uh, after that he was able to walk across the room without kickstart, without a therapist, and then they sent him home. Uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, an example of taking somebody that was a little bit further along and really helping to accelerate their uh, ability to get home. Um, and then this is a, a gentleman who, uh, he was 10 years post-stroke. Um, was independent in the home, but he lived in San Francisco in the, uh, the Twin Peaks neighborhood. And outside his front door it was a 30 degree slope. So his life kind of ended at the end of his driveway. Um, he started using Kickstart uh, as, as part of his daily activities. Uh, and these are some examples of the exercises he was doing in therapy. And uh, similar to Donna, after about a year, um, uh, after, well, after two months, he had doubled his walking speed to the point where he could cross the street before the stoplight changed with Kickstart. Uh, and then after about a year, he was able to do that again uh, without the technology. And now he, he too is completely independent and uh, hiking and uh, they sent me a, a picture of him in a canoe a couple weeks ago. 
Um, so what does the future hold? Um, as far as devices go, uh, uh, we, we got to work on something for the arm. You'll notice a lot of these patients have uh, contracted arms. Um, I haven't quite solved that one. But uh, one thing I do know is that it has to take into effect uh, not just uh, improving outcomes, but reducing costs, because that's the, uh, the reality we live in right now. Um, uh, how many uh, uh, companies did you cover, Luke, where <laughs> Uh, the, the goal was just to uh, get some clinical data, maybe a regulatory uh, submission, and then let somebody else gobble the company up and worry about actually commercializing the technology. Uh, the vast majority. Yeah, uh, those days are gone. <laughs> now, uh, you have to think about who's going to actually pay for the thing before you even start to develop it. Um, what is that uh, business model? And wrap that all together to, to really make sure that you're uh, going to be successful. Um, but I think there's also uh, a pretty bright horizon here for uh, utilizing technologies like Kickstart with uh, um, stem cells and, and gene therapies. Um, I don't know the details, but we've had several patients who have told us that they've gone out of the U.S. and have enrolled in some stem cell trials. Um, we have a woman in uh, Michigan who has multiple sclerosis and claims that the stem cell uh, therapy she took halted the progress of her disease. She still needs Kickstart to utilize what functions she still has left to uh, be independent. But uh, as these uh, better drugs and biotech therapies and uh, gene therapies come on board, I think there's a, uh, a great opportunity to use Kickstart and other technologies like it to combine with those therapies and, and really get a, a great, fast outcome for a patient. And. Uh, I'll leave you with one more story. Uh, this is Albert. Um, Albert was at work one day, and he had a headache, and his speech started to slur. So uh, he started to go home. And it wasn't until he tried to get uh, off of the highway, and he couldn't get his foot off of the accelerator pedal that he thought something was uh, really bad. Um, paramedics found him and said, all right, Albert, you're having a stroke. We know what to do. Uh, took him to the hospital. And uh, when he woke up, he couldn't speak, and he couldn't move. Uh, a couple weeks later, his wife filed for divorce while he was still in there. His parents said, it's okay, Albert, you can come, come home with us. Um, five years later, he finally learned how to uh, really speak again. Uh, about seven years later, he regained uh, the use of his uh, hands, but 13 years later, he was still using that wheelchair. Um, now that he's got a kickstart, he, he's left that behind. If uh, you know somebody that uh, might benefit, uh, please reach out and uh, give me an email or uh, uh, sign on to our Facebook. And uh, happy to talk to anybody after this. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Brian. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Brian. Um, I think that was a really nice job of describing the patient experience on, on your device. You know. Uh, we can save some questions about the clinical trial data and what do the scientific data really say. We but, actually published one finally. Well, well, we'll get to that later. But um, no, I, I mean, often that's where you know so many presentations kind of begin and end mm -hmm. is with the clinical trial data, but they don't go all the way and exp really place the device or the drug into that truly human context. So I, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so next up. Last but not least, Liz, uh, with BioViva. Tell us about uh, your vision for gene therapy okay. here in Seattle. Okay, fantastic. So I'm affectionately known as the woman who wants to genetically engineer you. And that sounds kind of crazy. And you might wonder why I would want to do that. I mean, you're perfectly fine people, right? But there's something wrong. And I'm going to tell you about it. It's called biological aging. We're all biologically aging. And you've been told that this is normal. But actually, it's not normal for every species on the planet. Uh, some species have what's called negligent senescence, meaning that they don't really biologically age over time. And we want to create humans that don't biologically age over time. And as a matter of fact, we want to reverse aging, biological aging. We want you to get chronologically older, but not biologically older, OK? So it's a big idea. And actually, the science is already proving that we can do this. We've done this in animals. And my company, BioViva, wants to move it to humans. What do you think of that? <laughs> Does that sound good? So let me tell you why we do this. So these 
are what you consider diseases, and they are, but they're all symptoms of biological aging. Uh, you don't get these if you don't biologically age. And these are costly, and they incur a lot of suffering and financial loss, okay? So here I'm gonna state my point in one graph. We're gonna look at this, and we're gonna look at age by group and deaths in hundreds of thousands. If you follow this graph across, you'll notice at about the point of 45, we see a big bump, okay? We start actually moving up into our aging diseases. Uh, we essentially start to get our diagnoses of what's going to kill us. So what is normal? A lot of people tell me that dying of biological aging is normal. But actually for humans, it's not. If we look at how we died in 1665, we actually died of infectious disease. And without medical intervention that we have now, about 90% of us still would. Only 1% of people died of aging. That wouldn't have changed without the intervention of medicine. Let's look at see what happened here, okay? Right here, we see the difference between 1850 and 2010. We see that before the advent of antibiotics and immunizations, we lost over 25% of our population before the age of 10. That's a lot of people. Here, uh, this graph is a little bit mixed up, uh, we see the difference of what happened when we brought in immunizations and antibiotics. It was a big bump in life extension. Our health span lasted a lot longer, and we were a more robust society. Over here, I don't know if you can see the little blue line that came in between the orange and the red. You're probably wondering what this is. This is increased lifespan of six to 12 years. This is huge, okay? This is within our lifetime. This is between 1970 and 2010. A lot of people ask why this would happen, and they would think, oh, well, this is you know, new pharmaceuticals, this is uh, Pilates, this is new dieting. But actually, this is only the cessation of smoking. <laughs> so since 1975, we really haven't had any big advances. Down here, if our graph was working, I think my keynote turned to PowerPoint here, you'll see this is the bottleneck, and this is something that we'd like to break. We would like to see people living longer than the average lifespans, and as a matter of fact, if you go back even to 1665, the longest lived people are living about the same t amount of time as the longest lived people today. You're just six times more likely to reach 70 today than you were then. So what's wrong with our system? Today, this is pharmaceuticals. 97% of all the pharmaceuticals out there that have been around since the 1920s only treat the symptoms of diseases. That's it. We haven't moved the mark. 3%, the 3% cures are still the antibiotics and immunizations. That's it. Still stuck with the same thing. But this is where my company steps in and actually 13 other major companies in the US, gene therapy. Did you know that in just 2015, we have developed through much research and through different companies, almost six potential cures for disease. This is a big change. So why would we treat biological aging? Let's get back to what my company does, okay? So of those other 13 companies, they all treat orphan diseases. They treat things like muscular dystrophy and adrenal leukodystrophy. They treat rare congenital uh, blindness and hemophilia. Why would we treat biological aging? I mean, we know personally why we would, but what is the impact? So by the year 2020, and I want to really get this into your head, by the year 2020, with the whole world, everywhere in, on the earth, there will be more people over 65 than under five years of age. 
So, as the five-year-olds become 15 and then 25, they become the workforce. And as the 65-year-olds become 75 and 85, they become terminally ill. We won't have enough people on the planet to actually afford the health care of this ailing and aging population. It's projected by 2040 that over 40% of the gross GDP of the U.S. will go into health care alone. Okay, this is actually a problem we can't afford. The great thing is, I should tell you this, as, as lifespan increases, fertility rates go down, and that's actually why you see these numbers. Around the world, fertility rates are going down. A lot of people ask me about overpopulation. So why gene therapy? So I am a proponent of human use of gene therapy. So don't get me wrong in these slides. I want to treat you. I don't want to treat mice. But mice are a great place to start because their short lives actually help us analyze how much sort of lifespan and health we can get out of these type of therapeutics. So this is going to put things into perspective. So here's a field mouse. This guy is living out in your backyard and his lifespan is about six to eight months. He gets a little slower and he gets eaten, okay? If you take that same mouse and you put him in a cage and you take away predation, this mouse will double its lifespan. Same mouse just gets anything he wants to eat and doesn't have to worry about anyone eating him. If you take that mouse and you put him on calorie restriction, you limit the amount of calories he eats to only exactly what he needs and you exercise him, you can again double his lifespan. And as a matter of fact, the mouse on the left is the same age as the mouse on the right. He's just had everything optimized, okay? Enter gene therapy. We change one gene, one gene in the mouse. And as a matter of fact, this is FGF21. This is a gene that humans have. You double that lifespan without changing any of the diet or exercise. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. That's one gene. That's one change. That's a gene that you have, that I have, that mouse has. So how does gene therapy work? Okay, so what we do, today what we do, we'll deliver it in different ways in the future, is we take a virus, a virus that doesn't get you sick. We use AAV. It's a virus that has a very low immune response in your body, so we don't have the issues that gene therapy used to have. And we take out its ability to replicate. So it can't go in your body and make any more of itself. What we put there is a human gene. And what viruses are really good at is attaching to your cells and getting the gene of interest into them. That gene then goes into your blood and then starts attaching to cells. Oh, I'm sorry, the virus goes into your blood, starts attaching to cells. The gene goes into your cell and it starts making the protein. So what you need to know is DNA makes protein and protein makes you. It makes everything about you. It makes your cell walls, it makes what you look like, it makes your hormones, it makes everything about you. So what we do is we put in genes that we want to see the protein uh, developed. And that's what they do. They go in and they start making the protein and that changes you, okay? So what are our therapies? So when we're treating aging as a, as a disease, there are very uh, certain things that we want to do. One of them is we want to lengthen your telomeres. Okay, does anyone here know what a telomere is? Some people know what a telomere is, okay? So telomeres are the caps on the ends of your chromosomes, and you actually have a repeating sequence of them, okay? You have a T, T, A, G, G, G. And it repeats over and over, and every time your cells replicate, they get shorter. And as they get shorter, what a, one of my advisors says is bad things happen. And these bad things are things like cancer, uh, they're uh, misfolded proteins. Uh, they are a slew of incidental things that lead us into biological aging. 
okay? So one of the things that we want to do is lengthen those telomeres because the end result, believe it or not, is there's a limit. And when you get to your limit, you get senescent cells. And senescent cells are cells that no longer want to divide and they really define where you are on the death curve. And that's definitive, we actually know that. So there's a gene called HTERT and it lengthens telomeres and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. We also wanna reverse atherosclerotic plaques. So this is what causes heart disease and it builds up in your arteries and if it busts loose, it gives you a heart attack. Uh, misfolded proteins goes into that area. We already talked about senescent cells. We wanna strengthen your muscles, boost your immune system because herein lies the the potential uh, fix against cancer and increase your cell signaling. So telomerase inducing gene therapy. So here's your, your chromosome here in the middle and these are the telomeres at the ends of your cells. So why would we use a therapy like this and what would we use it for? Well, it seems like kind of a fix all. It's something that everyone would want uh, in their cells. We definitely want our cells to be youthful. In uh, research, it actually uh, increases cellular division. So there's no longer a limit on how many times your cells can divide. It resets the genome to a youthful state. And guess what? This has reversed aging in animals. It's actually reversed aging, biological aging, in every human tissue it's ever been applied to. So we're really excited about this one. We wanna use it for Alzheimer's to start out so that we can start gathering data. We wanna target the microglia and the Schwann cells in the brain so that we can see if that will actually help clean up some of the beta amyloids and the tau tangles. BioViva's myostatin inhibiting gene therapy. Who wants to be stronger? Okay, anybody want to be stronger? I do, okay, I do. It's very important to me. As a matter of fact, it should be important to everyone because frailty kills 7% of the population. And that's a lot. And it's actually, um, it leads into many of the other diseases that we deal with, like diabetes type 2. We have a myostatin inhibiting gene therapy. Our doctor took it five years ago. He's had uh, great effects from it. Uh, the side effects are increased muscle mass, stamina, uh, insulin sensitivity, and decrease in white fat. And here you can see that in these um, images. So this is not steak. <laughs> this is actually an MRI slide of the legs. And on the left side, it is before treatment. And on the right side, it's post-treatment. And what is hard to determine from these because they were two different MRI units, so they're a different color, is on the right side, it's four months after treatment. The treatment continues to build for actually 12 months, but you'll see that there's more muscle, uh, which is the interior, and less white fat, which is the, the white ring around the outside. So again, this would be great for sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting over time, and uh, diabetes type two, and obesity. So we're very excited about this uh, therapy. So I was told to actually talk about some of the future of genetic cures uh, because that will be very interesting to us and I think that the, this future will come much faster than you think. Okay, we're, we're moving at neck breaking speed already. So I believe that they'll be given like immunizations. They'll be given to people younger and younger as we vet all of the various issues and promises of the gene therapies, whether they affect the germline or not, meaning whether they affect your offspring. Uh, so this woman here who's getting her gene therapy is 250 years old, you can tell. <laughs> And uh, she's taking a boost in gene therapies to ensure that she doesn't biologically age and does not uh, come down with these uh, disaster of, of ailing um, diseases of, of old age, essentially. So the future consequences of gene therapy and genomic engineering. Genomic engineering is something that we'll be doing later down the road. Right now, we're doing gene therapy, which means we're really good at putting one gene in at a time. Okay, so monogenic diseases, meaning diseases where just one gene is affected, we're really good at replacing that. And that's what we're seeing with a lot of these orphan diseases right now and these companies moving forward to treat them. They're finding one faulty gene and they're replacing it. We're moving quickly into editing. Everyone's probably heard of CRISPR technologies where we'll actually be editing in and out 
larger parts of the, the uh, chromosome. And then genomic engineering is a future technology and it's much more powerful. But here we'll see some of the things that we may be doing is, of course, organ regeneration, but right in the body. Uh, we know some of the genes now that turn on the ability for the body to regenerate. So there are animals that have these genes and they are able to grow whole limbs back. Uh, we'd like to start with organs and, and go from there. Immune system, uh, someone was already talking about infectious disease and we saw how powerful infectious disease is. So infectious disease used to kill 90% of the population, today it kills 3% of the population. But as we slowly knock off aging diseases, uh, we know that our big nemesis will again be infectious disease. Radiation resilience, I've talked to NASA about this. Um, gene therapies that help the, uh, the, the body's chromosomes stay together and reconstruct. We're looking at animals that have the ability to do that. And when I say that, remember, we share the same DNA with all of these species. It's just what we have turned on and what we don't. We have the ability to manipulate this, so it's very exciting. Better vision. I'd really like to see us expand our visual range. Wouldn't that be cool? We could redefine what colorblind is. There are billions of colors we don't see. How would you like to see them? It's very cool. Uh, cosmetic uses, of course, you know, if we're able to reverse biological aging, you will look younger. If we're successful, you will definitely look younger because if not, we've failed. Your skin is an organ. And it works in animals, so we want to translate that to humans. Digital interface. This was um, an interesting one that I was talking to some people about. We are more and more interfacing with our devices. And our devices may in the future be actually made out of DNA instead of ones and zeros. They may be biological units that we're interfacing with and that will really change us. Aging, intelligence, and physical enhancement kind of all go together in a package of things that most people want. <laughs> and nutritional, uh, so that could be uh, you know turning the, the gene for vitamin C back on, so you're making your own antioxidants. Uh, you, you have it, it's repressed. It used to be turned on in the human, and it's not anymore. Auto autoimmune disorders is something we definitely like to get a handle on. So I actually got started into all of this trying to find cures for children. I was unlucky enough to have a sick child and ended up in children's hospital with him. And I was told, even though he would have died without medical intervention, he has diabetes type 1, I was told that I shouldn't be so upset that I should look around the hospital. And I saw a lot of kids that are no longer alive today. And so I would love to find these cures for kids and I went looking and ended up at a genetics conference and found out about all of these aging uh, genome, genomic cures. And so uh, autoimmune disorders are one of the big, big hits to young children and so that would be fantastic. And of course congenital diseases which we're already doing through treating monogenic disease. So this is our scientific advisory board and they're some of the best in their field and of course I always like to give a thanks to them at the end of a, a talk and this is just wrapping things up and thank you so much for listening great thanks a lot Liz sure. okay so um, if all of our speakers could come on up we'll start with some questions and answers So I can get started with, uh, with a couple, but um, I want to make sure everybody feels like they have a chance to ask questions of the panelists as well. And, and we do have um, a couple of folks running around microphones here. So uh, you'll just have to raise your hand. If you, you want to go right ahead, go right ahead here in the, in the middle. Um, could someone bring him? Mike, why don't I bring you mine? 
speak up. Can you just uh, identify yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Sumit Basu from Microsoft Research. I had a question for Chris, actually. I hadn't heard about adjuvants before. It's super fascinating. Um, it sounded like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like uh, it was not something that was directly bonded to uh, the weekend um, viral particles, but instead were, were just mixed in as a, as a solution. And uh, given that that was the case and that could amplify the immune response, uh, can adjuvants work on their own? Like if somebody begins to have an immune response, you fire in the adjuvant, can it amplify their immune response just to the ordinary um, surfacing that they're seeing of, uh, of, of particles of an infectious agent? Sure. Great question. <laughs> Thank you. I was de-microphoned here. But, yeah. um, so to the first part of your question, yes, most adjuvants are simply mixed with the vaccine antigen. Um, there, are, there are some studies that indicate the adjuvants are more effective if they are chemically linked or absorbed with the antigen. Um, and so some vaccines, um, that, that is how the adjuvants are made. But that is more difficult in practice from a manufacturing standpoint to accomplish. So it's not always um, doable. And then the second part of your question is, what do adjuvants um, do on their own? And so typically, um, adjuvants are pro-inflammatory compounds. So if you were to inject a large amount of adjuvant throughout all your body, um, you would get some reactogenicity. You know, you're, you'd get these danger signals going up. So um, it's key when we're dealing with adjuvants to make sure they're targeted to just a local site and that there's only enough there um, to, to generate the immune response that you need and, and no more. And, um, but um, that said, if you were to in inject the adjuvant alone, and we've done this in clinical studies, you, uh, in a low dose, you know, you don't see any um, um, safety issues or anything like that. Like, they're safe on their own as well. But, but it, the body doesn't know what to direct the immune response towards if the antigen's not there. So you wouldn't be able to get a a specific immune response. It would just be a non-specific one. I guess I was thinking yeah. of a situation where, so let's say that you had acquired a disease, you'd just been infected with a disease. Uh -huh. uh, and so you did have the infectious agent, uh -huh. your body was trying to mount immune response, yeah. and could you amplify it then with just the adjuvant? Yeah, this, this is a great question. And, and it, it goes along with the post-exposure prophylaxis point. Right. Um, so yes, um, there's, you know, if, if the agent is already there and, and the adjuvant is timed to coincide when the agent's there, you bet uh, there, there's an opportunity there that using adjuvant alone as a monotherapy, you could get some vaccine response. So yeah, complicated in practice, but doable in theory. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah, here on the side. Yeah, question for Liz. Are there any human trials of your technology going on right now? Thank you for asking. <laughs> so actually we're raising investment money to do uh, phase one clinical trials offshore the US, but we do have uh, one uh, human trial that's going on right now. So I told you about uh, the telomerase inducing gene therapy um, and the myostatin inhibitor. I took both of the therapies on September 15th. It's been four months and um, I'm doing well. And my company and Harvard, um, we've got a group up there that's studying my body uh, to see what's going to happen uh, through taking these therapies. So yeah, we, we, we definitely do and we're, we're collecting data on um, some of our past patients as well. We've treated adrenal leukodystrophy and uh, frailty in the past. So now Liz, as a follow-up, uh, I know one of the big issues with gene therapy historically has been delivery. Yeah. Can you get systemic delivery? I mean, well, safety was one issue with the delivery, but uh, more recently with the AAV vector, which I think you're using. Yes. Uh, which yeah. is safe, but are you able to get uh, broad uh, s uh, systemic delivery? Because a lot of the gene therapies that are coming forward now are very localized, like in the eye or to a s certain cell type, but not getting all the way through the body. Yeah, the, believe it or not, there's some very good AAVs out there now, and we are having some modified for our company specifically. Uh, the second and third generations are getting better and better, and we use a broad spectrum AAV right now um, that, that actually hits multiple cell types. It hits dividing and non-dividing cells. Uh, so with the therapeutic I took, we probably hit about 30% of the cells. Our hopes is to target stem cells specifically uh, so that those stem cells go on to proliferate, which can be, it can mean about one year to a year and a half to real uh, good results. 
Okay, great. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yeah, here in the middle. Why don't I just, if you can identify yourself. Thanks, uh, Phil Swan. I'm also at Microsoft. Um, so, question for Chris. I um, saw, you were, you were talking earlier about how the, the response time from discovering a new disease, um, like the swine flu or something, to the point where you can manufacture enough vaccine uh, to save the planet, let's say, um, is too long. And um, about a year and a half ago, I saw a British science show, I think it was Dare O'Brien's science show, and they talked about a technique that they developed to uh, rapidly d develop the virus, and it actually involved using a cyclotron, of all things. I was wondering if you'd heard of this, knew anything about it, could tell us some more. I have not heard of that um, specific example. Um, this, I, I can say, you know, this is, of course, you know, a lot of smart people are interested in this topic. And so um, you may know influenza vaccines, the traditional way they're manufactured is in eggs, right? It's very complicated ch chicken eggs. And so they have to grow the virus up and then purify it out and very complex. Um, and this is why it takes months and months. And um, so there are, there are many people working on the synthetic protein approach, so not using eggs. Um, and then, and, and actually there is an FDA approved vaccine now for flu that is synthetic proteins, not made in eggs. It's a company called Protein Sciences. So they can, they can manufacture it faster. And then there's also the, the mRNA approach that I mentioned. And this is much more early stage, but uh, there's papers coming out that they can make a vaccine in a matter of weeks rather than months. Um, so I wasn't aware of that specific example. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. No. Chris, uh, just a follow-up on this mRNA thing. I've written about a company in Boston, Moderna Therapeutics, raised a lot of money, has a big partnership with Merck to do mRNA <clears throat> vaccines uh, along the lines of what you discussed. Do those still require adjuvants, or are they potent enough where basically you just put that mRNA sequence in, it starts making the protein that you want to train the immune system against, and that's enough? So I, th I think the jury's still out. Um, the, the caveat there is that the mRNA itself um, may have some adjuvant properties. So this goes back to the question from the gentleman over here about what are adjuvants. Some of them are, um, they look like RNA or DNA structures from the pathogen. So you could actually encode adjuvant as well as antigen in that mRNA and get everything in, in one fell swoop. Um, that, that's a ways off, but they may have adjuvanting properties on their own. Well, they have to uh, make them less immunogenic in the first place, though, right? In order, f there has to be some way to deliver them, again, into cells so that it doesn't spark a massive inflammatory reaction. Exactly, yeah. So it's, it's a delicate balance. Um, you need to get it delivered into the cytoplasm at a local site of injection. You don't want them going everywhere. And you want to make sure you can express the antigen and if you can um, also have some adjuvant signal there, maybe modest, but that, that could boost your response as well. Interesting. It is, is always a delicate balancing act whenever you're talking about immunology. Um, question I saw a hand over here. Oh, oh, there in the back. Go ahead. Hi, Dilek Tansoy. I have a background in biotechnology. I was just wondering when you're producing adjuvants, are they mainly spatial or are you putting some? chemicals in there to um, ensure they are binding appropriately or um, they are um, taken by the body as, as intended. Also about the protein part that you mix with the adjuvant, how do you ensure that it binds to the right place to mimic the pathogen in the body? Two very good questions. Um, so your first one, you're asking whether adjuvant, the adjuvants we work on are small molecules or versus a physical particle? Physical, or do you have, add any chemical properties to it to ensure it acts as intended? So both. The answer is both. Um, and, and most adjuvants have both physical and chemical properties that um, allow it to be an adjuvant. So some, some adjuvant formulations contain very specific molecules that bind to known receptors on our immune cells. Um, so these are called TLR agonists, to be technical. Um, and those have a very defined known chemical structure. They're made synthetically because we want them to hit that receptor. Other adjuvants, their mechanisms are less well known. Um, they're based more on physical dimensions. So they're nanoparticles, like a virus would be. 
And it, it's unclear all the reasons why, but they help the vaccine get taken up in, the, in immune cells, because immune cells look for those kind of particles to engulf. Um, and so there's some physical properties that um, help it to be an adjuvant, but we don't know of specific receptors that these particles are hitting. So there's two things going on. And you can imagine you might have both approaches in one. So you have the defined chemical molecules, but they're formulated in a nanoparticle. And so now you're hopefully getting the best of, of both approaches. And remind me of your second question. I was wondering about the protein part that you mix uh, with the adjuvant. Yes. How do you make sure it binds in a way that the body's going to take it as the pathogen? Yeah, so that, that goes back um, to the other question about um, linking the protein part with the adjuvant. If you can link it to an adjuvant particle, that helps the immune cells find it easier. They like to take those up better rather than just a soluble protein floating around. But the key thing is that the protein and the adjuvants should be injected um, at the same site around the same time. It's really that temporal association that matters. Just one more follow-up. Do, do you think that could be like one global adjuvant that can work for all types of vac vaccines in the future? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. I mean, that would be great. But you, with different diseases, you're looking for different immune profiles. And so there's not one adjuvant that would, would at least today, that would work for all of those indications. Yeah, over here on the far right. Oh, actually, I think he was first. Right. Then we'll uh, go over to the far right. Question to Chris first. Uh, and, uh, Chris, you mentioned about uh, mRNA. I know that mRNAs are, are not very stable. So you know, when you inject it, uh, can you just comment on the stability and how much do you have to re-inject or not? And a uh, related question to Elizabeth. So with uh, you know, AAV or any other DNA-based uh, viruses, you, know, you have a DNA that would uh, either degrade within the cell or have some DNA that may potentially integrate into the genome, and therefore we had a number of uh, gene therapy uh, clinical trials that were halted. And uh, I was wondering if uh, you considered RNA as an alternative approach that could be probably you know, less, uh, more safer. So you've hit on what I think is the biggest challenge of mRNA vaccines, and so, um, and that is the stability. You're exactly right. Um, they degrade very easily. And so the challenge that, that people, the development people are working on now is can they be formulated in liposomes and in particles that will protect them from the enzymes that would degrade them? Or can they be engineered to have a, a more stable you know, RNA sequence through chemistry? I think both approaches are, are ongoing. I like the formulation approach. That's, that's my background. But um, it's a huge challenge, and that remains to be seen if, if we can do it. Okay, so that's a great question. So we have a couple ways that we can do AAV. We can actually integrate it into the chromosome, and what's fantastic with AAV in humans, we know where it goes. So uh, some of the viral vectors in the past, you probably know, had integrational mutagenesis, which means they can kind of just integrate anywhere, and they can cause cancer. Uh, with AAV, we integrate into chromosome number 19 and in a very specific spot. Uh, but actually, what we set to do is to just just place the, the gene into the, um, the, the, the nucleus, and it will actually stick with the cell until division, at least, and maybe beyond. So uh, the AAV2 generally had the rep caps. It had the ability to integrate, and the synthetic uh, forms of AAV, you might think of uh, one through nine, tend to not do that, okay? They took that ability out. So we don't integrate, usually. As far as the RNA goes, uh, it's very temporary, and if we wanted a very transient sort of gene therapy, that would be okay. But with the two genes that we're looking at, uh, we want to upregulate these ones uh, permanently. Now, I know that with telomerase induction, some people may have some worries, um, but we believe that our studies will show that, in fact, it, it is a protector against cancer and not the cause of cancer. So the, the worry with telomerase is often associated with cancer. Uh, because many cancers, about 80% of cancers, have telomerase turned on. Telomerase helps cancers grow, but what it also does is it helps regular cells grow too, and it basically fortifies your immune system, and we believe that this fortification of your immune system will keep you from getting cancer. Uh, so the reason that a lot of people like the RNA sort of delivery method is because it's transient. We can go in and lengthen some telomeres and get, and get out a dodge before anything goes wrong. Uh, but we believe that the, the research strongly shows that actually going in and upregulating 
living permanently would be where we want to be. For instance, uh, our friends the lobsters uh, have negligent senescence. They go on and on. They don't die of aging diseases. We actually know that they probably only die of predation. They don't get many of the diseases, obviously, that we get, none of the aging diseases, and they're fortified against cancer. And they have telomerase turned on in all their cells. They're not the only one. So we're taking a blueprint from nature and trying to use it. But that, I hope, explains uh, to you uh, why, we, wh why we're not looking at RNA delivery now. But we might look at it case by case. Uh, since we're a small company and we treat patients, if that was the patient's desire, we could certainly do it. They would just have a short-term effect. Stanford did a study with telomerase induction in the heart tissue uh, with RNA. And it did regenerate the, the hearts in short order and the RNA left. But then, of course, now they're biologically aging again. And that's, that's the, the issue that we're looking at curtailing permanently. Now, Liz, you, you use that word permanently. Um, and I know since the very beginning, people have talked about gene therapy as essentially a one-shot deal, that you mm, get long-term yeah. long expression, right, right, of the gene of interest. Right. But we've seen some recent studies that suggest maybe you get expression for a while, uh, but then it wears off. And then what? Do we get a second, a booster? Yeah, so that's or, why we were looking at the immunization. So AAV is considered the most permanent gene therapy so far, but we don't know, and that's true. And so we look at integrating, but we also know that integrating when the chromosome is unbalanced, we believe that it could be kicked out later. And so putting it in the cell, it does tend to replicate with the cell, but for how long? So we talk about permanent right now, but that's true. That research is out. It's going to take many, many years to find out if that, in fact, is true, but by the time you needed your second dosing, uh, hopefully of gene therapy, it will be so inexpensive that it will be a negligible cost, and hopefully, you know, governments will actually cover these. We literally save trillions of dollars a year not having aging diseases. That is another issue because gene therapy is likely to be expensive, but we'll go yes. get that later. Right uh, now it I is. know on the far right we have a question. Thank you. My name is Kai, and my question is for Brian. Uh, I'm a, among my other careers. I'm a dance instructor, so I've been through a lot of physical therapy in my life. I love the results you're showing. Can the kickstart be used to achieve peak performance in athletes and dancers, as well as just get someone back to a functioning life? Um, we've looked into that a little bit, uh, and. Uh, when you or I walk, uh, there's a lot of really subtle efficiencies that we uh, uh, take advantage of. And if you put a, a big device on top of uh, your leg, uh, it takes a lot of those away. Um, but when you take somebody who is extremely impaired and you restore uh, you know, maybe 80% of those efficiencies, it's a, a big difference. So uh, that was one of the initial ideas of the Exotent. And is, you know, can we make super soldiers? Can uh, we... Uh, uh, can I climb Rainier without breaking a sweat? Um, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that's uh, something where you need a, a external energy coming in, but uh, uh, it is very effective for people who are very uh, impaired. We've got one here in the back. Hi, Brian, I have a question for you as well. My sister has multiple sclerosis, so um, she's been in a wheelchair for almost 10 years. She has very good functionality. Well, I should say she has much better functionality on one leg than the other. She can keep her you know, stability in her torso. Um, I, I guess the question is, I, I could certainly email you later, but does your device work if both legs are equally impaired or would it work if somebody had slightly more functionality on one leg than the other? Um, we can use Kickstart with both legs, but uh, usually uh, if somebody has better strength on one leg than the other, they uh, start first with uh, the weakest leg, and maybe they have to add it on the other leg later on. But uh, uh, in the case of MS, we almost always start with uh, just on the weakest leg and, uh, and go from there. Okay. And can I follow that up with a quick question for Elizabeth? There is a um, neurological component to multiple sclerosis. Is there any gene therapy that affects the brain going on? Yeah, as a matter of fact, there is. We're looking at partnering with a company uh, that was started from a guy who works with the Hugh Hefner Institute. Uh, he actually has a gene therapy that he wants to start moving forward for MS, and it may also help in ALS. It helps with the myelin sheath. It regrows it. It actually works in animals, and he'd like to work, move it into humans. And of course, BioViva would love to be part of that. 
uh, the future is actually really bright in these areas. So, yeah, yeah, hang in there, definitely. Uh, I think we've, sh you're next, here on the right-hand side. Uh, how about, a, I'll, I'll take it over here. I have a couple of questions for Chris. What is happening with the, with the exoskeleton that is no longer in use or with the brace that is no longer in use? In the cases of people who no longer you need them, who are able to walk on their own? Um, is this a question about I'm sorry. Uh, can Fine. it be reused? Uh, yeah. And the question is certainly yes. Um, uh, the way our uh, healthcare system is set up, though, uh, insurance only pays for uh, any type of brace if it is customized for a patient. And there are product liability laws that prevent us from reusing it with uh, other patients, which is uh, really wasteful and really dumb. But uh, you see a lot of uh, nonprofits that spring up and they take uh, discarded braces and prosthetic limbs from the U.S. and take uh, them overseas. I lived in Colombia for almost 30 years and and still go there and there's a lot of people who could use that and I know of someone who could afford to buy one, I'm sure, um, if it can be of use and I will contact you about that and, and see what he is doing at this point because I haven't been in contact for, for quite some time. <laughs> Wonderful. And Liz, you mentioned the cost of, of the gene therapy. Yeah. Um, what kind of costs does yeah. this incur today? Right, so gene therapy is really expensive. So uh, each therapy is still built individually per patient. And what I want you to picture is uh, the amount of titer. So this means the amount of virus that we need to put in the body with the genes in it is really in the quadrillions. So right now it's at a very expensive therapeutic. So something like a myostatin inhibitor uh, would come in around a quarter million dollars. Uh, we're hoping to get investment to build a lab so that we can get that cost down in half within a year and within in about a quarter within two years. And so that uh, more uh, people can actually afford these therapeutics and get it into a price range where insurance companies will consider covering them. And I'm sorry, I do have a question for Chris, excuse me for using the wrong name uh, before Brian. But Chris, have you looked at the possibility or, or our are vaccines ever dried? That's a great question. And preserved that way, because I have a special interest in dried. Excellent. Um, yes. So there are some vaccines, we call it lyophilized or freeze-dried, and that does increase their stability. Uh, and in fact, it can make it so you don't have to refrigerate them, which is a great advantage for the developing world. On the other hand, they become somewhat more complex to administer because you have to reconstitute them, um, make sure they uh, go into solution before you inject, and there's been errors in, in remote clinical sites where they've reconstituted with the wrong fluid. So th there are some challenges that it introduces, but the advantages often outweigh those. And in fact, we're working on a dried vaccine that contains an adjuvant, and um, it's a complex adjuvant, and so uh, many people were surprised that we were able to freeze dry it. And um, it's a single vial with the vaccine and the adjuvant, and we're being supported by the NIH to take that into the clinic. It's for a tuberculosis vaccine. So we're, we're very interested in that technology. No, I'll try it. I'll try it. <laughs> but, a, but a dried vaccine obviously has advantages with uh, you know, shipping in uh, hot climates, um, which has been a problem for a, a lot of vaccines. Um, yeah, question here on the, in the front. Question for Chris. Uh, if the adjuvant is not, or in those cases where it's not bound to a particular protein and injected in a local site, um, what, if anything, prevents the adjuvant from triggering other proteins that are in your body healthily and normal from triggering that kind of reaction as well? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And um, this, this, of course, is, is a prime um, topic for safety and toxicology testing is to ensure that there's no autoimmune responses associated with vaccines, whether there's adjuvant or not. So the, the first thing that's done is to make sure that the vaccine proteins themselves 
don't, um, uh, the word is homology, but don't share similar sequences as our own proteins. They have to be foreign sequences. And then as far as the adjuvant goes, the key is to formulate it appropriately and, and deliver it in very small doses. Um, if it's not formulated and uh, it's injected, um, then, you know, it can diffuse to other sites. And uh, you won't necessarily get autoimmune type reactions, but um, it, it will, you will get um, inflammatory type reactions, you know, um, maybe some, some fever or malaise because it's an inflammatory agent, you know, it's, it's, it's a drug with side effects. So um, the main thing is, is to formulate it so it's localized and um, only have the amount that you need and uh, ensure that the vaccine that you administer it with is really representative of the foreign pathogen. So, if I can just follow up, does the adjuvant have a relationship or a, a targeting to a particular protein that you're, you're putting that in with, or is it just causing a general response for the body to look at any protein? Uh, the answer is both. So, so um, it creates what we call an immunocompetent environment. So, the adjuvant itself causes more immune cells to come to the injection site, investigate what's going on, and then they're looking for foreign proteins. Okay, so if they're, if they're associated with the adjuvant or administered with it, that helps them identify those and take them out. There was one point I wanted to make to amplify on Liz's answer to the lady on the right and about the cost. So Liz, you, you mentioned 250000 and that's, that's actual cost, manufacturing, not, not the uh, end price. The, the end price, uh, well, we don't yet have a single FDA-approved gene therapy in the United States, so there is no, no benchmark. There, well, there is one in the European Union, um, and that is roughly about a million dollars um, yeah. converting over into euros for a rare disease. And many people believe that this is kind of setting the, the benchmark. Uh, this is kind of what we can expect, million, right. dollar, million dollar treatments. Right, so uh, what's really important, the, the difference between our company and a lot of these companies that are doing this is they're raising a billion dollars to go through the FDA. And what we're doing is we're going offshores. We're doing FDA clinical uh, level of trials where we're getting, gathering all the data. We're using a professional company in order to do that, but doing it at a fraction of the the cost. And so what BioViva hopes to do is actually drive the price of these therapeutics down massively. So as we see uh, gene therapies come through clinical trials here in the U.S. and come out with a million dollar price tag, uh, we'll be offering them for a fraction of the cost offshore of the U.S. So we're trying desperately to actually get cost-saving therapeutics uh, to the world. Right, so we have to, they all have to go through safety and efficacy first. We can't rush too much to market, but what's fantastic is uh, some of the work has already been done. So what we're really good at is gathering the data on therapeutics that are already going through uh, some amount of clinical trials or have really good basis of research uh, in the laboratories, okay? So our myostatin inhibitor is very similar uh, to a gene therapy right now that's at Nationwide Children's Hospital that's treating muscular dystrophy. And as a matter of fact, it's the same gene. So it's already through safety and efficacy. It's going into phase three clinical trials with Becker's muscular dystrophy, and it's going into phase one for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. We're using it for a different indication in offshores, and we'll have it for a fraction of the cost to treat the whole population for frailty. Um, so safety and efficacy is proven. It definitely increases muscle mass, and it um, increases strength. So we're, we are um, looking at these type of avenues so that we can get products to market fast, very fast. So, so Liz, I mean, are you, are you essentially saying that you want to go after the medical tourism market? Yeah, we are a medical tourism market. Yeah, yeah, well, right, so everything is based on investment, right? So with the right investors, we'll be to market within, within two years. Right. Question here in the middle. Are you targeting the, the 
Okay, so that is when we talk about, this is what a lot of people ask us about is enhancement. You know, so at what point is it preventative medicine and what point is it enhancement? So initially what we'll start is we'll start working with people who are terminally ill. So we'll work to try to cure diseases um, in compassionate care because this is, um, for one thing, these people actually need help and they need help now. Over 100,000 people die every day of aging diseases. These are all people who are opportunities to come and take a treatment with BioViva. So, um, but we know that in the future these therapies are going to be worked back farther and farther and I would not be surprised at, that in 40, 50 years we're seeing these as early as the 30s. Question, question uh, here. Uh, you mentioned medical tourism. I happen to be on Medicare, being 74 years old. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, and I inquired once about being able to receive some care in Colombia, mm -hmm. because I have some infrastructure and some knowledge there. And I was told I couldn't, at least not to be reimbursed by Medicare. You're going to have to to get some people to change their minds. Yeah, we've we've got a, a big upward <laughs> uphill battle. Uh, we are we are definitely aware that our first early adopters will be people who can afford it. We hope to, with their money, gather the amount of information that we need in order to bring these therapeutics back to you and get them expedited in the U.S. So definitely, it's not going to be a situation where everyone is going to be able to take advantage of it. But if you can imagine five years out, if we're still cutting costs down, then then this might be um, something that you can actually afford to do. You might be able to go to Thailand or Mexico or, or Fiji Island and various places where we'll be sitting and waiting for care. We actually have a clinic in Colombia, Bogota, Colombia. Okay, Good. Karen, I, I, you've had a couple questions. I know this lady here has been patient. Um, and we only have time for one or two more. Thank you. I have a public health question. You know, there's, it's obvious what an impact vaccine technology has had on humanity. And if you're right, Liz, uh, we're going to need those technologies more and more. What do you guys think about this anti-vaccine movement that's going on in the U.S. and worldwide? Do you think it'll die out the more powerful vaccines are? Or do you think it's really going to become a, a public health issue? I guess I'll take that one first. Um, I mean, this, this, this is a big challenge, right? I, I have a neighbor that doesn't vaccinate, you know? And um, they've got little kids, they wanna play with our kids, you know? Um, my daughter, we just, uh, my youngest daughter was very, very young, and, and we decided, uh, no, we don't, we don't want your unvaccinated kids coming over right now until she has a chance, you know, to get protected. So th this, is, this is a real issue, it's touching all of us. And I think vaccines, vaccines are a victim of their own success. In fact, a study was just published a year or two ago in, in a leading journal saying that no matter how much you preach to your neighbors and your friends about how they need to get vaccinated, sometimes that can actually steer them the other way and make them more set in their ways. What really works is if they're reminded about how devastating these diseases are that we've completely forgotten. You know, how many of us have seen a kid with measles or pertussis, an infant with pertussis? I mean, that is scary. And um, unless we collectively remind ourselves about the devastation these diseases cause, you know, maybe that's what it's gonna take. Um, I, I don't see a rapid end in sight of the anti-vaccine movement. <clears throat> Antibiotics are another victim of their own success, too. We often take them for granted and um, don't really fairly reimburse companies who make new ones and uh, wonder why we have the development of drug-resistant superbugs. Um, so, mm. um, Oh, yeah, okay, so I, I can definitely say that I have a lot of slides. Um, if you had people who were interested in looking at them, they could be modified uh, very well so that people can understand. But I think that it's a little bit of a, another problem. And this is from somebody who just got whooping cough. I got it last uh, winter from a bunch of kids who weren't vaccinated, and of course I am because I know the statistics. But I think that there's a big failing between the public and our government, and people are not trusting what is being shot into them. And I 
I think that it has more to do with that than their belief system. And that's why we really need to start pushing out medical cures now. We need to show that there's, there's a difference between uh, pharmaceuticals and what's going on with the lobbying there and actually getting cures to people so they can see things knocked out in their lifetime and actually be, get a new trust uh, with, the, with, with medical uh, solutions. Wow. That would be uh, wonderful. New trust. Uh, I, think that's, uh, I think that's it for us. Everybody, could you please give our panelists a round of applause? <laughs> Luke, thank you very much for uh, uh, helping us tonight, and I uh, hope you really enjoyed the program. Look forward to seeing you next time at uh, Future of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics, or uh, on February 10th with uh, the venture capital community. So thank you very much. Thank you.